Over this past summer, you have had the privilege of being able to hear from a variety of our pastors preaching from the pulpit. And today, it is our privilege to have another one of our pastors, Quinlan Lee, who is our discipleship pastor. She is responsible for helping adults across all of our campuses grow deep in their faith in Jesus Christ. And we have the privilege of hearing from her heart as she here preaches to us from the Word of God. So would you please join me in prayer as we pray for Quinlan and this sacred moment. Father, we thank you for your fellowship with us. We thank you for your leadership of us. We thank you for the reality that our life is founded upon Jesus. And God, we thank you for our sister Quinn. We pray that, Lord, you would bless her and bless us as she preaches and teaches from the words that we may therefore also move forward with our faith in you to be the kind of people you need us, you want us to be for the world that's around us. Bless this moment for all of us, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please welcome Quinlan Lee. Good morning, everybody. My name is Quinlan. I know some of you and some of you I haven't gotten to know yet. Um, Jonathan told you a little bit about what I do for my day job. I also want to introduce you to my family so you'll see them jump up on the screen. My husband, Steve, and my children, Cooper, AC, and Hannah. They are 22, 25, and 26 and live everywhere from San Francisco to Nashville to India. So all over the place. Um, I also want to show you a picture of what they looked like when we first started coming to Forest Hill. So that's what they look like in 2001 when we started here. And that's important for a couple reasons. One is that at all of our campuses, our families are worshiping together today. So I know what those Sundays were like. And so I'm just here to say it's okay. The children are going to make some noise and you're going to have some trouble focusing a little bit and that that's all right. We're good with that. We're going to read in scripture today that Jesus said, welcome the little children. And I don't think he meant except in worship. Never welcome the little children in worship. So I also wanted to show you another important picture. This is me in the year that I became a Christian. So important because not that I wanted you guys to just have a moment about how awesome 80s hair was and that it took a lot of product, a lot of work to make your hair that big. And so as much as we're excited 80s and 90s and fashions are coming back, we're very excited 80s hair isn't coming back. But I'm pointing that out, how long my family has been here, how long I've been following Jesus, because this message we're going to hear today from the book of Mark, I think is especially important for those of us that have been following Jesus for a while. He is speaking specifically for disciples. So if that's you, whether you had 80s hair or whether you didn't, then listen up during this message. Also, if this is maybe not your story, if you're newer to faith, or maybe you're here in, because someone made you come or they're taking you to Ruby Sunshine for brunch or something afterwards, and so you're not sure about following Jesus, then I really want you to hear what Jesus has to say in this passage. Because I hear again and again from my friends that don't follow Jesus, that it's not Jesus they have a problem with, it's the rest of us that cause it hard to follow him. And so if you're not sure about following Jesus, I pray that you would reconsider this morning, that you would listen to what Jesus says, that you would see what he does and that you would um, consider maybe following him. So we're going to read a big chunk of scripture this morning. We're still in the book of Mark. We're in Mark 9. And because it's so long, I'm going to have us all stand, as we often do, in reverence for the reading of the word. But about halfway through, I'm going to let you sit down. Not because I think y'all are not capable of standing that long, whether you're at home or at one of our campuses. But more because I think it's hard to focus sometimes when you listen while you're standing for that long. So if you will stand now in reverence for the reading of the word with me. This is from Mark 9, starting at verse 14. And when they, James, Jesus, Peter, and John, came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. 
And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. You may have a seat. Then the story continues. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not in- want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of man, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand this, that what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, but we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes Causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. So when I was given this passage to by the teaching team to preach on this week, at first I was really pumped because I love when the Father says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Um, honest truth, I am a person that struggles with doubt, that wakes up some days and is like, this is hard to believe Jesus is real and that he died and rose again. So I was really going to go in that direction, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But when I sat with this passage and when I um, asked the Holy Spirit, to teach me, and I started reading some commentaries. Here's what I noticed. The disciples are not acting very well in this passage. Over and over again, you hear that they're arguing. Some of the translations say they are discussing a lot. And as I started to sit with that, I started to think, I, I'm, I do that. I've been doing that a lot, especially in the last few years. I've been doing a lot of discussing and arguing with some other disciples. And frankly, I see that we as a church, as a church in the world, as a church in this country, have been doing a lot of arguing with one another. And I started to say, what are they arguing about? And the things that I noticed they said are, whose fault is it, who's first, and who's for us, and who's against us? So the disciples are spending all this time wondering, whose fault is it that this isn't working? 
Who's first? Where do we measure up? And who's for us and who's against us? And those questions started to kind of stir in me, and I realized I'm the person that asked a lot of those questions. But more than that, I started to think, what's going on behind those questions? Have you guys ever heard that saying, the thing behind the thing? That it's not just those questions, it's there's some emotions there. So I wanted to spend just a sec looking at the disciples and what's going on in the way that they're arguing. So if we go back to the beginning of this passage in Mark 9, it says, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. So the first thing I noticed the disciples were arguing about and why is because they were frustrated. They thought they should be able to throw out this demon and they weren't able to do it. And the reason they thought they were able to do it is because they had just done it. If you bounce back a little bit in Mark, in Mark 6, verse 7, it says, And he, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So they've done this before, and now it's this moment of truth. Jesus is up on the mountain. They're ready to cast out the demon, and it's not working. And I don't know how you guys feel when this happens. I do not like that feeling. Like I'm trying to do something at work and it's not working or trying to do something with my computer, it's not working. Or the instant that I thought of the most that I've seen this happen is when my children were young and they started freaking out in the middle of like Target or Teeter or heaven forbid Trader Joe's. And they are just losing it in the frozen food. And I am pulling all the things that have worked in the past. I'm like counting to three, I'm pulling out the fruit snacks, I'm like giving them times out and nothing is working. And the very worst thing that can happen in that moment is heaven forbid my spouse or some nice lady comes up next to me and tries to give me advice about how to make it work. We're going to start arguing right then because I was mad at my child, but now I'm mad at you because I'm so frustrated because something that I wanted to have happen is not happening. So I think part of the reason they're frustrating is because what used to work doesn't work anymore. And we've all been there before. I think they're also a little bit out to prove something because the ones that are arguing aren't the ones that got to be up on the mountain with Jesus. If you've ever read the story that comes right before this, it's the transfiguration, and James, John, and Peter are up on the mountain. Well, who's not up on the mountain? The other nine. They're down there, and all of a sudden, the pressure's on, and they're not able to do this, and they start to feel really stupid, I think. And I think every time our identity gets based on how we perform, if we're able to do something well and it doesn't work, then we start to become really argumentative. And we start to want to know whose fault it is, play the blame game, that this thing isn't working. And so they're arguing about whose fault it is. And generally when you go from asking whose fault, you go pretty quickly to that next question of who's first. If you look at Mark 9, um, verse 30 through 34, right after this, it says, They went out from there and passed through Galilee. And he, Jesus, did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he was killed, after three days he will rise. And they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for the way, on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So at first I thought, well, why are they arguing about who's first? I mean, they're hanging out with Jesus. He's first, duh. And I thought, well, maybe they're ambitious jerks. I mean, maybe Peter, John's, and James, they weren't supposed to tell anyone what happened on the transfiguration up on the mountain, but maybe they couldn't help themselves. All of a sudden they're like, dudes, you will never guess what happened. Like, Jesus, all in white, it was amazing. Or maybe the other guys were also trying to kind of prove, no, I'm the greatest. I left more, I serve more, I love Jesus more. 
But I think why they were arguing about their fir- why they were first may have been more because they were confused and because they were afraid. Jesus starts talking about being crucified, and they get really afraid and confused because they don't know what he's talking about. And then they start arguing about who's the greatest, and then he busts them by saying, what were you arguing about? And they again get really afraid, a little embarrassed. And again, I think we can relate to this as everyone, but especially as disciples of Christ, because didn't we start acting like this a little bit in the pandemic? Who's first during the pandemic started acting like, how do, is there enough? Is there enough time for me? Is there enough money for me? Is there enough toilet paper for me? These are the things we were arguing about during the pandemic. And when we are fearful, we start to wonder who is first and start forgetting that Jesus is first. And I think this can lead to pride. I'm the greatest disciple. Or it can lead to legalism. Maybe if I do everything just right, then God will bless me and I'll be first. Or sometimes it leads to deconstruction. I thought following Jesus was going to feel a certain way or work a certain way, and it doesn't seem to be working out, so you know what? I'm out. This isn't the life I signed up for. He's talking about crucifixion. He's talking about rising from the dead. Like, never mind. I'm done. And so they start to argue about where they measure up in the kingdom, and all of a sudden they get to the place that I think a lot of us can end up pretty easily in who's for us and who's against us. Let's figure out what sides everybody's on. In Mark 9, 38, it says, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. He doesn't say because he was not following you, Jesus. He says he was not following us. It's almost like Jesus, John cares more that they're not on brand. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not on our team than he does that people are being set free in the name of Jesus. And honestly, this is something that I have seen in the church over and over lately. I've seen it in my own life over and over lately where I'm spending a lot of time asking, whose side is everybody on? Are you right or are you wrong? Are you right or are you left? Are you for us or against us? And I'll, last summer I was talking to a friend who doesn't follow Jesus. And I was like, you know, I mean, we've been friends for 30 years. Why are you not following Jesus? And you know what she said? Because Christians are awful. She's like, if you can explain to me why Christians can be so mean, especially to one another, then I'll consider following Jesus. And I didn't really have a great answer for her. I had to say, go try to read the Gospels and let's talk. But I was pretty embarrassed. I was like, yeah, we're not, we're not making ourselves look very good lately, and we're definitely not making our God look very good. So that's the problem I felt when I was reading this passage, that there's these disciples that they're fearful, they're fault-finding, they're feeling like they're failures, they're frustrated, and all they wanted to know was who's fault, who's first, who's for us, and who's against us. And in comes Jesus, and he gives them three completely different questions. The questions he asks them are, are you praying, are you serving, are you being salt and light? So let's break those down a little bit by going back through the passage. Let's start with, are you praying? So there's this boy. He has convulsions. He is in great pain. And it says, after Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit and rebukes the boy, his disciples ask him privately, because they're kind of embarrassed, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And I'll be honest, if this had been me, and at the end of that, Jesus had said, really, you just need to pray? I probably would have been like, uh, thanks, Jesus. Prayer was, I, I needed something more, like a little bit of I've been Jesus duped here. Like, tell me a little bit of more than just next time you should pray. But then I started thinking, we have a picture in this story of someone who is praying. Because if all praying is, is talking to God with complete honesty and complete helplessness, who's praying in this passage? The Father. He is coming to Jesus, and he is saying things like, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I believe, but help me with my unbelief. 
I find in my own life that the reason prayer gets jacked up sometimes is I either think I'm doing it exactly right, I am checking all the things on my prayer list, I'm saying exactly the right words, I am really good at praying, or I, or I talk to some other people and they're like, I'm terrible at praying, I don't know how to do it, I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up, I'm trying to use the right words, I don't know how to pray, I'm getting it all wrong. And in this passage, here's how we see the father praying. He's just being honest. I'm trying to believe. I'm still kind of not believing. And that's how God is calling us to pray. C.S. Lewis, who some of you may know, has this great quote when he talks about prayer. He says, we must lay before him what is actually in us, not what ought to be in us. So if you're praying and you're trying to like, be all put together before God, you're not fooling him. Be honest about what's going on in your life, who you really are, and invite him into that space with you. I also see that the father is playing with complete helplessness. He says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Help us. And we don't know how old this boy is, but we know it's been a really hard life for him. That it says for a long time the son has been mute, he's had convulsions, he's thrown himself in fire, in water, he's been foaming at the mouth. As a parent, I can't even imagine what this would have been like. And I don't know if you all have been in situations where someone you love has a cancer diagnosis or an addiction or something is going on with them and you just want to help them and there is nothing that you can do about it. You are powerless in that situation. That's exactly how this father feels. And I've walked through many situations in my life this way. One that jumped to mind, I think, because I'm a parent and reading this about the father, was we went through a series when one of our children was extremely ill and no one knew what was going on. And we would just take her to doctors, we would take her to prayer meetings, all these things would happen, and no one seemed to know what was going on with her. And I'll never forget, we took her to get an MRI one time where they were doing a full body scan, but especially of her head, because she was having headaches. And she, they came out, and later they said, everything looks good, the scan was clear. And she just broke down in tears. And she was crying not because there was nothing on the scan, because she actually wanted there to be something so we would have some answers, because we were so helpless. And I can tell you what my prayers were like in that season. It was me just driving around town, just saying, help, help, help. I don't know how to fix this. My child is in pain. I need your help. There's this great quote by Tyler Stanton, who's head of the 24-7 prayer movement in the U.S., and he puts it this way, and it resonated so much with me. He says, prayer or intercession is nothing more than ordinary love, like I had for my daughter, like this man has for his son, combined with sober humility. It's when you love someone and their needs exceed your capacity to help them. Prayer is what fills the space between the love and the humility, or I would say that feeling of helplessness. And those who dare to pray and keep praying get to live the adventures that run parallel to the unseen, hidden labor of prayer. You want to know what Jesus is calling his disciples to when they're feeling frustrated and fault-finding because they're helpless? The thing that I find he's calling me to when I start blaming and getting frustrated at things, he's saying, cry out for help. Get real with me. And I just started thinking about what this could look like in our lives. So you're on your way to work. All of a sudden you just go, help. I'm going into this meeting and I don't know how this is going to go down. Or help behind the closet door, the bathroom door. This is where I used to be. Help me not to yell at my kids quite as much today. I'm trying here, God. Or maybe you're on your way to the date. And you're like, help. Help me to see this person as made in your image, God. Help me to see them fully. Help me to be myself with them and honor them with all that I do and say. Like when you're on the greenway, when you're in your car, maybe at night when you first turn off the lights, just say help, help, 
this is what's going on and I need help. Sometimes it's even help. I'm not even sure you're real. I'm not even sure you can hear me, but I need help. Show up. I started thinking especially for um, those of you who may not follow Jesus yet, that there's two things that can really help in this situation. One is a real basic thing that we're going to be doing here starting in August. We're going to have a class that's going to be in person at our South Park campus or online. Tuesday nights in person, Thursday nights online. And we're just going to ask these hard questions. Where is God when things are hard, when there's pain and suffering? Why and how is Jesus the only way? Where did the Bible come from? Why do we believe in it? What's going on with that? So if you're someone that struggles with some of this question, some of these unbeliefs, this is a chance to say, that's okay. We, we understand. We get that. Let's talk about it. And if you're someone that gets asked these questions by people who aren't Christians, this is a chance to go, how do I, how do I talk about those things? So I invite you to come to Core Questions. I'll be there with some of my other friends, with Daniel and Jody leading that. Um, I also just invite you to try it before you buy it. The honest story of my Christianity is I wasn't sure about following Jesus, but I thought, well, maybe if I start just doing some of the things that Christians do, I'll see if it works. And it did. (laughs) God showed up. I started praying things like, I don't know if you're real, but I need some help. Show me you're real. And things would happen. And I'm like, huh, there may be something to this. So I invite you, if you're someone who isn't sure about following Jesus, that you just try praying some of these honest, helpless prayers. So first Jesus says, how are you praying? Next he says, how can you serve? If you look at Mark 9, 35 through 37, when they're arguing about who's first and who's for us and who's against us, he, Jesus, said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put them in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And then a little later he says, but one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So Jesus, instead of us arguing about who's first and who's for us, teaches us a whole new ranking system. And it reminded me of this story that um, I read in a book recently. I think it resonated with me because it was about someone who was on a field trip. She was a chaperone. And they were taking the kids to a planetarium. Have you guys ever been to a planetarium before? You guys know what a planetarium is? It's one of those like auditoriums, but it has the universe. Like you lay and you see quasars and galaxies and stars and all this stuff. And so they're going in with all these kids and they are all pushing, shoving. Everybody wants to be in the front row. Like I'm going to get the best seat in the planetarium. And she looks over, and there's a sign on the wall, and it says, all seats provide equal viewing of the universe. And she started to think, that's, that's truth. That all seats provide equal viewing of the power and wonder of what God is up to in the world. And I've noticed lately that... Um, When I'm in not a great place, I get in this habit of starting to compare my story to everybody else's story. Like, okay, maybe I want to jump in on their story, or this would be better if I was here instead of there. And God just keeps saying to me, no, 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 no. I have a story to write exactly where I have put you right now. All seats provide equal viewing of what I'm up to in the world Find your seat and let me show you something that will blow your mind. And so if you're in a place where maybe you're worried about who's first, who's for you, or who's against you, I would invite you to take a seat, any seat. And Jesus is very clear on how you find your seat. He says it's by choosing to go last, by being a servant, by welcoming a child, by giving out cups of cold water. And if you can't figure out how to do this, we have all sorts of easy ways for you to do it. 
you just jump on the Forest Hill website, go to foresthill.org backslash global outreach, or just go on any number of websites, go on that QR code, you'll find things like Project 658 that's helping refugees get settled all around the Charlotte area. You'll find great things like Harvest Center that's helping families find homes. You'll find freedom communities. You will find places where you can tutor kids, where you can hold babies for teen moms with young lives. There are all sorts of ways to jump in. Jesus says, start serving. Find out what I'm doing in the universe, and you will be disciples that will change the world. Which leads us to the very last thing that he says. He says, are you being salt and light? And I'll be honest, the end of this passage gets a little weird, and we're not going to get all into it today about cutting off our hands. If you guys were listening when I was reading, people are plucking out eyes and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to put it this way. One of the ways that you can understand that passage and that I've come to understand that is by if you pluck out your eye or if you cut off your hand, you can't hide that everybody's going to see that you're walking around with one hand. That it is part of Jesus saying your brokenness is going to be noticeable to the world. And that that's okay. That that's how we become salt and light is not by hiding our brokenness, but being honest about how we're working on it with the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to like an AA meeting or an NA meeting Or maybe you've been watching the bear like I've been watching the bear and seeing how he goes to those meetings. But when you're in them, and any time I've been in them, this is what always goes through my mind. This is exactly what church should be like. This is exactly what my bridge group should be like. Because there's all these people that are standing up, and you know what they're saying? I am a hot mess. I am broken. I am messing this up. I am doing the best I can with God's help, but it is hard. And you know what everybody else in the room says? Thanks for sharing. Me too. With God's help, we're going to do this. And I think that's part of what this passage is saying. If we want to be disciples that aren't arguing, we're not figuring out who's for us and who's against us, we need to be a lot more open about we're all trying, we're all trying to get beyond the things that separate us from God and that we are not being hypocrites and finger pointing and judging, but instead saying, me too, I'm broken. Let's do it together with God's help. So Jesus closes this passage by saying this, He says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This may have sounded kind of familiar to you if you've ever read the book of Matthew or heard about um, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says a similar thing there. He says in Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." So he is calling us to be salt and light in the world. And he's saying we lose our saltiness when we're arguing with one another. And instead, we need to be servants and letting our light shine by welcoming little children and passing out cups of cold water. And then maybe our friends will give glory to God and our neighbors will come to follow him. So what's next? I was laughing with a friend who, um, I, she was praying for me. We were talking about preaching, and she said, you know what I hate? I hate when preachers don't put it on the bottom shelf at the end. I hate when they're just not like, go out and do this. So here's what I'm going to say. Here's what you need to go out and do. Don't argue. Don't ask whose fault it is. Don't ask who's first, and is it me? Don't ask who's for us and who's against us. Instead, pray, trust, 
Trust as best you can. Say, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Pray honest prayers. Be yourself before God. Pray helpless prayers. And I really believe if you pray and you serve, if you get salty, that we're going to discover the greatest promise that Jesus has in this passage. He says this great thing. He says, all things are possible for the one who believes. But you know, with this promise, when I started to think about it, really depends on what comes after that word believe. You can't say all things are possible for the one who believes in themselves or in their own abilities or in their political party or in their religious beliefs. He's saying all things are possible for the one who believes in him. So I just wonder, are you believing in the God of all the universe who made the beautiful things that we see every day? Are you believing that he's at work in your lives and at work in the world around you? I don't know about you guys, but when I was thinking about this, I thought that's that's who I want to be. I I don't want to be a disciple who's arguing all the time. I don't want to be a disciple who is concerned about where I'm stacking up. Instead, I want to be a disciple, and I want to be part of a church that's full of disciples who are just walking around all the time saying, how can I pray? How can I serve? Am I being salt and light? I wonder and hope and believe that we can become that kind of church and ask that you join me in following Jesus to be that. Will you pray with me? Thanks. (laughs) Jesus, thank you that um, you interrupt us when we get off track, that you do not let us kind of stay in our own mess arguing and fussing with one another about who's first and how we stack up. Lord, thank you for calling us to pray just as we are, that you don't ask us to get our acts together and then come to you and pray, that you say we can just pray, be honest with who we are and how we're struggling, and that you'll rush in to help us. Lord, thank you for letting us cooperate with you by serving and giving us the awesome opportunity to be your salt and light in the world. We love you, and we are so thankful to be your sons and daughters. We pray these things in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.